Finland, Romania, Hungary, France, and Spain, and Italy, building new ecosystems, that convenient ability is crucial because for a lot of companies, they don't have the ability to be able to access that level of community. We could showcase that adoption, not necessarily the technology, but that adoption and the way it was adopted to the rest of our ecosystems across the globe. What is it you do? Where do you do it? Why? And what do you need to assess danger, risk? Okay, let's start with the basics. Welcome back to the Health Tech Crew podcast, where we explore the nexus of healthcare and technological advancements. I'm Igor Gorlatov, partner at Kepler Team. Today, we are honored to have with us Andy Bleeden, the Communities Director at ECH Alliance. Known widely as the Global Health Connector, Andy truly embodies the spirit of connectivity in the digital health realm. With a vast experience spanning over 30 years in healthcare and regeneration, he has seamlessly bridged the gaps in the sector, helping a network of over 70 international digital health ecosystems and connecting with a whooping 1,000 member organizations. His specialty lies not just in building connections, but also in sourcing and implementing both European and national funding, fostering partnerships that revolutionize the landscape of digital health. Without further ado, let's dive into his vast reservoir of knowledge and insights. Hello, Andy. Thank you so much for joining me on the uh, Health Tech Crew podcast. Good. Good to meet you. And uh, I'm glad to be taking part in this too. So let's talk about ACH Alliance. Uh, could you share some successful collaborations that happened recently that demonstrate the value of this organization mm. uh, through connecting different ecosystems? Okay, let's start with the basics. So the ECH Alliance is the Global Health Connector. We've been around for about 13 years. We're a member organization. Uh, we bring our members together in ecosystems, digital health ecosystems across the globe. Um, that's now um, pushing on to be open up our 80th ecosystem. Um, I joined the first one, so um, back in 13 years ago. So the successes of that network means that we can do four things with our members. We connect them, we convene them together, we amplify what they do, we accelerate their innovation from one region to another, one country to another, one continent to another. So an example of that was two weeks ago, we were uh, in New York for the UN um, Science Summit, UNGA, as most people know that. And so we ran a global connector session there, bringing what I thought was a fantastic group of people from across the globe to talk on specifics, specifics around aging, green health, data and digital and women's health. Again, with a model, simple model of, you know, what's the need and what does good look like and where can we collaborate better? So we're able to bring, you know, the usual suspects that have been around in the healthy aging space from across Europe, the US, but also Africa, Australia and India. Another example I think is a really good example is where we can bring using our convening ability to bring together a group of countries together on a similar topic. So recently back in June, we convened all our ecosystems for the Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries. So Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Estonia in Finland to showcase their innovation, their digital health success stories to each other in a way that just wouldn't necessarily work with a trade mission or, or a visit because of the cost. It's a fantastic way we can do of convening those ecosystems together. So our ecosystems are multi-stakeholder, they're permanent. They bring together um, all the stakeholders of health with the idea of transforming healthcare, but also creating economic, economic opportunity. And that means for me, matching need and solution. So we, we were able to do that there. So there's two examples for you. I'm kind of very tangible guy. I love those examples from the point of view of convening groups, mm -hmm. but I'm curious the outcomes of those conventions. Mm -hmm. Have they resulted in some actionable projects? Let me give you a practical example. So, and, and, and this will resonate with a lot of people. So during the pandemic, we sought out the 
best practice in scale up um, for uh, rollout of digital health approaches to the pandemic right at the beginning. We wanted to showcase what we call best in show uh, from country to country. Um, our, our immediate problem we could have at the time, we couldn't bring people physically together because of the band. Um, so we showcased innovation that was being rolled out across Scotland for virtual hospitals um, and also for remote consultation. Um, it was being rolled out and tested in the highlands and islands of Scotland, very remote areas. That was then, because of the pandemic, adopted nationally across Scotland. At first, you know, in the usual sort of government way of things, quite slowly, but with the pandemic, then that was rolled out instantaneously across Scotland at pace and scale, then across England, then across Wales and Ireland and Northern Ireland. We could showcase that adoption, not necessarily the technology, but that adoption and the way it was adopted to the rest of our ecosystems across the globe. Thank you for sharing this specific example. And I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your career journey. How did you end up as community director at ACH Alliance? Well, my background's um, quite lengthy. I used to work in psychiatry in, in, uh, with mentally disordered offenders, working with some of the naughtiest boys and girls in England. Mm-hmm. Um, did that for many years, working on the streets, uh, rehousing people, putting them back into the community, sometimes putting them back into hospital. Um, I did that for many years, worked in health and social care for well over 35 years now, as well as doing bits of regeneration and a lot of work around um, social care, especially funding. So I was very good at getting um, money for projects Mm. and delivering projects, successful projects, but also forming long-term multi-stakeholder, multi-country partnerships. Um, those are essential to be running these types of projects. I also did a lot of work with the European Commission, um, evaluating proposals, scoring projects, um, assessing projects, and then reviewing them when they when they completed. Um, because I had that ability to be able to sort of have an out, you know, a helicopter view. You know. And then joined the ECH Alliance um, to look at that fund role, but also then started working at building on what was then a growing network of around 20 plus ecosystems and a member community of about 600 people both of those have not just doubled they've, they've actually really grown so we've now got a membership base of around 1100 people uh 1100 organizations i said so um 23,000 people on our in our network our community that i see them and about 80 ecosystems so that's what i've been involved with doing building that community with colleagues um to make that connectability that we've got, that connecting um, skill we've got to be able to think like we've just done just recently in, in uh, countries like Zambia and Zimbabwe and, and, and um, Tanzania to say, actually, this is exactly the same model that if you want to do uh, there, we can help you um, spin that out, but with your flavour on it. And that's the same across each country. So all our ecosystems are different. Um, I thank goodness that they are, because otherwise it'd be boring. I wouldn't be doing this job. Um, we'll definitely dig into this experience of building and connecting communities, but I'm intrigued by your ability to raise funds and navigate like bureaucracies, especially like within oh. the European Union. What have you learned really works in that space? Because most people struggle to deal with just one government of their country. <laughs> How do you get something done when there are so many stakeholders involved? So the, the trick is with funding is to be really clear um, about what your concept is. Always be really clear. And um, and always understand the fact that some of the many funding opportunities are very highly competitive. Most of the proposals that are submitted fail fail at the first turtle because they're not basic and simple enough for people to understand the concept. I, I, I use an example of, of phones. Okay, when, when you look at your phone in your pocket, typically that would have been designed five, six, seven years ago. Okay, so somebody would have sat down in a design studio designing the concept for that, the, the, the hardware, etc. So if you think about some of these projects, this has to still be new. Um, for when this project, this program hits the market. Um, so if you understand that concept, you kind of can think a little bit beyond the, the, the confines of I've got a phone and it has to have the same functionality as this phone does. So when you're building the program, understand what's the state of the art. 
and how you're going to move beyond the state of the art. And then, lastly, most likely, is you need to be able to demonstrate what you think the impact of that will be. And the last piece is usually the crucial piece that most people forget. Because it's so embedded with the academic background of their program, their idea, they get lost in the science. And they forget to talk to people about actually what that impact will be, how they will show it, how they will engage a, a stakeholder community. And very often, the last hurdle most most projects fail on is that, that idea of what is your impact going to be. I'm always curious if you, like, to what extent does luck play in this, in, in having competitive proposals? Uh, without breaching any commas. I can remember looking at several different proposals that were boring. Um, they were developing bloatware. And and the one thing that stood out was a project that was risky. It had a very clear need, had a very clear, clear solution. It was beyond the state of the art. And they had a clear stakeholder community and a clear impact planned out. But it was risky. That got through. The risky it one stood got through. out. It stood out. Um, got funded and stood out despite the science behind it because their concept was really clear the bloatware projects uh, as i said were boring i mean they were, they were just going to just it was a little, a little bit like you know we're make your computer even slower so it doesn't work for you so you cannot break it <laughs> and that's what they were going to do to a healthcare uh, middle middleware system they were just going to just completely slow down that electronic health record and so all of them uh, or scientifically perfect, went straight in the bin. Thank you uh, for sharing. Coming back to global communities and connecting ecosystems, what's the one thing that most people misunderstand about doing this effectively? They forget they've got two ears and one mouth, okay? And, and very typically, I see that with uh, many people who try to engage, you know, groups of people, especially on social media, and they go into broadcast mode. Me, um, us, our ideas, our concepts, our plans, and our strategies, as opposed to the first question I try and get across to people what I is, well, what do you need? So using your ears um, uh, as opposed to your mouth is very, very often a missing tool with community builders. Now, I, I qualified as a community worker even longer ago than when I started work. That was a skill I learned then to assess danger, risk, but also health and safety. There's a skill that's, that's stood with me since. I like to talk, but I always remember you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. That makes sense, but in practical terms... I'll give you, you, I'll give you a practical like example. Customer discovery or like engaging more... like. From okay. Your... I'll, give you, I'll give you two examples. One okay. very local, one global. So local, local example would be someone who's designed a very, very clever suite of tools to help people living with dementia to mm. use a smartphone. Fantastic. And, and the tools are fantastic. They're very slick, very fast. Uh, they've got inbuilt um, uh, AI credentials, etc. But they're not going to get worried. They're not, no one's going to use them. Because what they've not done is ask people living with dementia uh, about their cognitive skills their ability to be able to use smartphones, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and the case in being is, is, is where people develop technology without asking first what their need was. And you just actually chat to people, and I've been, been, been in many projects with these things, chat to people living with dementia, you say, well, what does it actually need? Well, I, I, I use any technology you give me, but I struggle to use my fingers. And, and then hardware people will, will, will bend everything possible to make the buttons bigger, the colors brighter, et cetera. When I'm thinking, what do people actually use in their daily life on a day-to-day -day basis to communicate? They use their mouth, their eyes, their nose and their ears. Very little to do with their fingers. So those successful software companies that perhaps think we can use voice activated software all of a sudden, all those issues around people's cognitive skills about pressing buttons and understanding that this button will do this task are blown away and people use it. So for case in point, very often you'll find people who are living with dementia can use things like 
Amazon Echoes or, or, or Alexas or, or the, the Google equivalent or other equipment because they can talk to it and talk back to them. They don't have to press any buttons. So that's local. Global, one of the mistakes many people make is when you go to different continents, like Africa, for instance. If I turn up to Africa and say, well, this is what I think your problem is, and these are the ways we're going to solve them, and we're going to build lots of ecosystems for you, okay? Uh, <laughs> because we know it works in, in, in um, Sweden um, or in, in Finland or in um, Romania, and we'll get laughed off the stage, okay? First thing we want to do when we, we go to new countries and meet new organizations is listen what's you know what's the state of digital health in your country what do you need what are your priorities and then we try to think well where where can we actually add value to what you're currently doing as opposed to we're going to come in with you know new vaccines new software and a, a nice you know platform for you and you actually thought you've already got it but we're too dumb to listen Thank you. That makes, that makes sense. And you've made the connection uh, for me to like working with different countries and different ecosystems. So it, does it mean that you spend more time listening, I assume? So could you talk a little bit, what does your week typically look like? Very often, if I'm based at home, so I, I, we all work remotely with the City Alliance. Um, what that means for us is meeting our members, so when people join us, new members join us, very often that's about us having the ability to sit down and think, okay, what is it you do? Where do you do it? Why? And what do you need? First, before we start saying, this is what we can do for you. These are the things we can do. So, so ask some questions first. So I have lots of meetings like that, just off one just now. Um, that's a great way to understand people and understand what they do. But most importantly, understand the why of what they do. Typically there, if I'm um, involved with those meetings with our ecosystems, with our members, that's obviously remote, online, can be phone calls and using different tools like WhatsApp, et cetera, or LinkedIn. So a lot of my work is based around using LinkedIn too. And then, then say in the last couple of weeks, that's meant traveling. So last week I was at, in Las Vegas at Health. I think most exciting um, wraparound experiences in the healthcare market. That will be coming to Europe in June. Um, the week before that, I was in, in Marrakesh in Morocco, um, at their harm reduction event there, meeting with uh, leaders from across 54 different countries, looking at the appetite there for an Africa digital health network of ecosystems. Um, prior to that, you know, I was in, uh, in Finland, um, building new ecosystems in Finland, Romania, Hungary, uh, France, and... Uh, also in um, oh God, the other countries, other countries such as yes, so Finland, Romania, Hungary, France, and Spain, and Italy, building new ecosystems. So when you are saying uh, building an ecosystem, uh, what exactly does it look like? So that 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 was about saying to 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 six different countries. Let's look at building an ecosystem that's targeting healthy aging. Let's look at what you think some of the stakeholders are needed for that ecosystem. Do you have them? Do you have the connections? Let's look at then what you think are some of the priorities of that ecosystem could be. Frailty, falls prevention, dementia, um, the use of apps, et cetera. Working with SMEs. And then building an ecosystem around that. Now that concept is then, I'll, I'll pick the one on, on um, frailty. Where, where is it you live, uh, Igor? What, where, where are you based right now? Uh, right now, Charlotte, North Carolina. So in North Carolina, I'd come to North Carolina and say, with colleagues there in, in, in North Carolina, what's the need for people who have just you know, come from the doctors, they've been falling over, having falls, they're in hospital. What do they need in terms of information, services, and solutions? What do their family need? What do healthcare professionals need? in terms of research information and solutions to monitor people in their own home? What do the city planners need, the policy makers need in terms of trends? And then lastly, what do researchers need in terms of data, access to data? Now, there's something that ties all of those people together. Is they never talk to each other, they work in silos. So our ecosystems are around breaking down some of those silos, starting with the need first, and bringing those, those people together. 
So that's part one. Then we'd flip it and say, okay, what does good look like in Carolina? Because there's plenty of good practice in, in North Carolina around false prevention. I'm more than sure of it. Um, so we bring in a piece of decent research, uh, a, a new policy perspective from Charlotte, someone who's doing some fantastic peer education for people who are recovering from falls, someone who's got a robot that helps people with their mobility. Again, they've all got something in common. Similarly, they never talk to each other because they're either too important or too busy or, dare I say, <clears throat> too ignorant to, to listen to what goes on around them. So we connect them together. Then we do a workshop which brings part A and part B together. So let's match need and solution in a workshop. Think, how can we scale up that peer education project? Where can that research be reused in another part of North Carolina? That policy that you introduced in Charlotte, what can we do with that and tweak it slightly for another city? Once we've got over some of the political barriers and the egos, um, to make a, a better success of policy in, in, in another area. And lastly, where can we provide access to scaling up the, 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 the robot strollata, the walker, from one part of the state to another? And if we did that alone, we've made some connections, we've matched need and solution. But typically what is missing there is that economic opportunity. So... We would then say, look, if you've, if you've got skin in the game around false prevention or recovery or rehabilitation and you're a business with an idea, you've got a captive audience of patients, researchers, hospital staff, policymakers, and all the other people in the game. You get two minutes and you can pitch. Three, what do you do? What's the problem you're going to solve? How are you going to know it's going to be fixed? And what do you need? Nothing more. So in some ways, you create that permanent ecosystem, which can then be then applied to a different area. It might be dementia or uh, diabetes or whatever. But that same approach, because many of the people will be the same. And you get a sense of permanence to it, as opposed to a one-off. Because if you get one-offs, people don't come. Patients just think, oh, I'm going to have to tell you yet again, uh, about what it's like to live with, you know, a, a constant risk of falls when no one's paying attention. So that's how it has, that's how they work. I love your explanation and how like specific you got in terms of like getting buy-in from stakeholders. I guess I have two questions here. One is how do you get initial buy-in from folks, for example, in North Carolina, you mentioned, because everyone is focused on their own agendas. Mm -hmm. What's getting the right people, people who are typically decision makers, or people mm -hmm. who are effective, they have a lot of stuff to do, mm -hmm. invest into this particular uh, collaboration? And secondly, what allows this to continue on beyond being just a one-off? Oh, we did this like nice thing, nice event. Mm -hmm. What allows and creates the energy for all those participants to stay connected and continue engaging? So firstly, get that buying. You usually need someone who's either running a cluster or a health information group. Someone who's already got decent connections locally. Mm -hmm. Someone who's already moving in that field, but they lack some of the stakeholders. Now, we're a member organization, so we've probably got members within that area as well to plug some gaps. But go back to what I said. Who are your stakeholders? Key stakeholders in, in, in healthcare, social care in the region. And that's everybody from patient organizations, citizens groups, carers groups, researchers, policymakers, local government, central, regional government, etc. Hospitals, nurse practices, pri private and public, funders, insurers, payers, etc. All those, those groups and their networks and associations. Who are the key ones? And then you that's where you start to, to pick out your priority areas. So you've got to start somewhere. So we have this really complicated strategic mantra of pick a date, pick a topic, and pick a venue. And they're going to turn up. Because usually, and if you start, if you start off with involving patients, industry will sit up and listen straight away. If you involve citizens, the local government has to listen. That's their job. 
you involve local government, then very often healthcare providers are there because they need to understand what the policy perspective is going to be and where the cash is going to be. And then lastly, if you involve companies, all of a sudden people realise there's an economic, economic opportunity here and the economic development potential is massive. Uh, just for clarity, do I understand correctly that you work with a cluster which has relationships in the specific ecosystem and you come in and help them unlock some gaps? In it's, all diff it's always different. So in some countries, in some cities, it's the cluster. In some cities, it's the local university and hospital. Um, so in the UK, very much that's built up around what was previously known as the Academic Health Science Network, now the Health Information Network. In other countries, those are economic um, health clusters funded by the government. In some countries, it's literally working with a couple of uh, people who are grumpy and, and just want to change things in healthcare. They might be businesses, they might be key decision makers. In other countries, they're they're actually run by the local government. So uh, they're they're all different because again, you 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 can't have one size fits all. But there is someone anyway who has relationships in that particular space. Yeah. But yeah. maybe those relationships are not like complete. And does it mean, do I understand you correctly, that you come in, you help bridge those gaps in this particular ecosystem, and you empower them to continue <laughs> running those groups on the yeah. without your hand holding? So we're we're a neutral body, okay? So in some ways, you know, I'll just pick your where you're from. The fact that you know that the the, the the ministry of 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 economy and justice, you know, they might be called there, doesn't speak to and doesn't even get on with the the person who leads that. So the fact that one one department called the meeting, the other one wouldn't go, or no one's spoken to the hospital since the big scandal of 1976 or whatever, all that local stuff comes with baggage we're neutral mm -hmm. so we're going to run this we're going to run that ecosystem that's usually sometimes easier for us to do to mm -hmm. actually say well we're, we're hostess we're convenient you'd actually just you know open up the building and put the coffee on um but we'll bring some stakeholders in who might be missing stakeholders such as patient organizations and i've talked about those before some of those are national or sometimes even uh, cross-border so we have european arms of or worldwide federations of different rare conditions what they are really good at is they'll have national regional local chapters of people who know who are the key key stakeholders whether it's in um north carolina or um northern sweden or or north australia because they've got connections that we would never have so there are connections connections same with universities. I mean, we've got 300 universities and research organizations that are members of us. And one thing about the, the university uh, network is there, uh, I can't put this politely, um, they work across multiple different uni universities. Once so they'll have a, um, a doctor uh, position in one university, a part time position in another, and, and, and several others. So they're very, very well connected. Very, very well connected. So they'll know. The eagle that I've been trying to write to in, in North Carolina. Oh no, he moved. He moved last year. He's now based over in, in Canada doing this this piece in Ontario. You need to speak to uh, Mark or Susan. So they've got that 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 that, that ability then for us to be able to think, okay, well we we're, we we might be able to plug some of those gaps with our connections connections locally. So that's really helpful. Yep. Uh, thank you for explaining this. I wanted to ask about the team. How big is team at a, uh, ECH Alliance and how are you guys funded? So the team's quite small um, and, and deliberately so. We don't have an office at all. Um, there's no central office. We don't have an office in Brussels, etc. cetera. We're, we're, we're registered as a community interest company in the UK and as a community uh, company limited by guarantee in the Republic of Ireland because of Brexit. So we have a, technically an office, a virtual office in Dublin and in Belfast. That enables us to be quite lean, okay, as an organization. So, you know, we're talking maybe 30 people, board of directors and some ambassadors who work for our, on our behalf across the globe. Um, we just put our latest, latest ambassador, Ayana Visku from uh, Estonia. Um, we have ambassadors in, in uh, the US and in Australia too, which enable us to be able to have conversations. 
as a happens in Carolina or or in um, Mississippi with 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 people that we we don't know, uh, you know, and they've got those connections. So, well, actually, you need to speak to these guys. So we're quite lean that way. And in terms of funding, our business model is very very basic. We we get membership fees. We're getting involved with European programs or government programs as a partner, and then we do events and some consultancy. So it's a three-way split. And always at that sort of level, because we're not a trade body, so the vast majority of our members are not-for-profits. So not-for-profits in the European, non-US sense, as in their, they're like 501, I think it's 501C organizations. They're, 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 they're charities um, or their universities or their hospitals or their government bodies or their patient groups. So we're very much bringing the need side to the table as opposed to trade bodies. That makes sense. But I think in the, some of the materials you shared, um, I saw that about 10% of your members are companies. Yes. They represent a company Kepler team, like a fairly small women-run but for-profit software vendor that focuses on digital health. And we work with clients in that space who are usually innovators building software or mm -hmm. like a product and software to complement that product. So for an organization like Kepler and for our clients, uh, is there a value proposition from uh, ECH Alliance? Would it make sense? Yeah, typically, the first thing I do is listen to what you do. I want to find out what you do, why you do it, and where you do it, like we said before. Because then I'm better able to say, okay, what, you, what we can offer is out of those four pillars of what we do, how can we connect you? How can we convene you together? But firstly, usually, is how can we amplify what you do? So typically, you know, that's about us promoting what you do through an introductory piece, through our newsletter, to the rest of our community of 23,000 people. This is Igor. This is who he works for. This is why. And this is what they need. And then we follow that up with a use case scenario of what you've done with software company number two, um, how you did a patient inclusion piece with software company number one, so we gradually build up that profile about you within our network. That enables us then to start making some connections with you, with other potential members within our community, other companies and other non-companies too that may have that need of that support. We can then go back to that ecosystem model, convene ecosystems, which actually these, what these companies lack is, 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 is you know, decent support from organisations like yours. So you can pitch to them at those events. But also, like recently, we've just done the huge big health event in Las Vegas. That's actually convening a global village. So a big US focus event. Right in the middle of that was a global village, uh, powered by the East Asia Alliance as our role as a global health connector. There we had a stage. We could actually showcase people, not only with their booths, their kiosks, but on stage and showcase our members, not just to a couple of people just wandering past, but to you know, a huge audience of 12, 13,000 people. That convenient ability is crucial because for a lot of companies, they don't have the ability to be able to access that level of community to make those connections or lastly, to, 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 to have that convening uh, power. Then add into that the idea of accelerating that. We, we've also run what we call virtual thematic innovation ecosystems, which oh. are horizontal in nature as opposed to vertical so they're not based in north carolina but they're on mental health or skills in health so typically that's about using multiple countries and seeing the same approach what's the need what does good look like but instead of just in one area in denmark and australia or on mental health i could bring in uh, the need for um, support for substance misuse from Montreal, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Finland, Denmark, and Germany. And then what good looks like in Finland, Denmark, Germany, etc. Now, that is a really good way to accelerate up adoption from one country to another. Because they can see how this has been adopted in one country. I think that's exactly what we want. I'm working in the substance misuse field. That piece of software, that solution is exactly what we want. That could be from country to country, or, and this is where we have to remember, people work in silos. In Finland, we were able to connect up a buyer who needed a software platform with, from Oulu in Finland with a supplier who provided said software platform, who was also based in Oulu in Finland. Never met. 
Mm -hmm. actually. That actually makes sense. And as I'm thinking, a lot of projects that Kepler does is similar. It's like making connections or integrations mm -hmm. between different software systems. Mm -hmm. So it looks like this is what you're doing as well. You're making connections between human systems. So mm -hmm. it's definitely something to potentially explore. And how much does the membership cost, like for a smaller so, organization? So for for our membership is is for not for profits, it's free. So that's not for profits as in charitable organizations and, and government bodies, but for for profits, all our membership is based on turnover. So we have a range of memberships that start with standalone entrepreneurs, you know, they're earning less than 500,000 uh, euros a year. That's a thousand euros you're in. Um, for small companies, 2,000, medium companies, et cetera, et cetera. That builds up to a maximum of 10,000 euros per year. So it's quite a small amount of money. But that enables us to be able to do that connect, convene, amplify, and accelerate piece. Now, there might be extra pieces of work that people want to do, extra programs, et cetera. Um, that sort of consultancy piece we talked about, those sort of strategic challenges. But for many organizations, many small companies, 2,000 euros to 6,000 euros is usually where they're pitching at um, to get that maximum ability. The question I always ask people is, what resources do you have? Not financial, because I guess that's like asking really rude questions. But what resources do you have to be able to produce that first piece? That first piece that says, who are you? What do you do? Why do you do it? And where? And what do you need? And then the resources then to follow that up with a, a use case scenario, a thought leadership a piece of podcasting. Because if you haven't got that, you're wasting your time. Not your money. It's not about the resources and money, but you're wasting your time because you'll get to the end of the year and you're still struggling to produce that first piece. You've wasted your membership because every month I can showcase you in a newsletter and on social media. And that amplification piece is not worth misunderstanding. So we have a, a, a community of, say, 10,000 people that subscribe to, to ECH Alliance on LinkedIn. Adding to that our our own, because it's much more about personal engagement, our own communities of followers, which then boosts that number up to 40,000. You think as a small company, to be able to use that as a tool on a regular basis and have your organisation profiled and showcased is priceless. The, the tr tricky question is, is have you got the capacity to exploit that yourself with, with the, 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 you know, the, the background, say, from Kepler to say, have we got those materials ready? Or can we get them ready? Or can we recycle what we've already got in the back, you know, in the back of the website to get moving on this quickly enough? Uh, that makes sense. And thank you for sharing this. Uh, this sounds very compelling for uh, sure. I wanted to ask on a more high level, in terms of digital health ecosystems, this mm. is an aspect of what we've been talking about. Given your global perspective on things, if you could change something about where things are, what would it be? Uh, I think there's, there's two, two areas that frustrate me. One is our data is not open. Okay. Our healthcare data is not open source. I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily open source software and breaking computers and hacking phones and stuff, but our data is not open. At, at the point at which you give your data across to healthcare professionals. If that was opened up, all the other pieces of electronic health records, um, software interoperability would suddenly become possible. Okay? And that's frustrating. The other thing that's frustrating is um, people work in silos still. I, I started work 35 years ago in, in health and social care. Silos there were between organizations. They're now embedded because of these bloody things. They're embedded within organizations. So even within organizations, people don't talk to each other. And that's um, a criminal waste of effort and resources. So sometimes within an organization, I dare say even within yours, you'll have activity, activities going on that you know nothing about. And success stories that you know nothing because you're so busy doing your job, Igor's job, or Andy's job, that you don't take, take account of what's happening just next door to you, um, and you don't see the bigger picture. And then, lastly, 
there's um, the opportunities I see are there for growth in unexpected areas such as Africa. Mm. Africa has a huge potential. Africa's on the rise. The numbers speak for themselves. By 2050, one in four people on the globe will be African. Mm. Um, they have a very low, low, uh, medium age. So the majority of people are age 35 and under workforce. Thank you for sharing this uh, perspective, both about challenges and opportunities. And I have my last question, which is what's the most exciting initiative or uh, thing for you or for, for you personally or for AC, uh, ECH Alliance? I think there's, there's, there's two that, that we've grasped, what we say in English sometimes, we've grasped the nettle. So we've seized the challenge of saying, we need to do something around healthy aging that's global. Instead of doing healthy aging for Carolina or the US, but global. So let's let's so we can use that, that idea of having a this this horizontal thematic ecosystem on healthy aging and bring into that um, input from Australia, India, Africa, Latin America, Northern America, Europe, and other countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and all of a sudden that population is covering billions of people. Now we already cover 78 countries, 4.6 billion people. Adding those last two countries, that doubles. Doubles. Add in China and the lessons there. So that, that's a really great opportunity. That excites me. And then the one, the other one is around green, green health. So we, we've launched recently a green health thematic um, because, you know, if healthcare was a, a country, we'd be the fourth, fifth largest polluter on the planet. But we have a special pass because it's health. So we can use single use plastic whenever we want to. We can use IoT devices we throw away and expect other people to, to, to clear up after them. This is our problem and we need to own it. And then lastly, the last one for me uh, is the one that affects half our population. So women's health, especially the menopause, is something that will, I think, in 10 years' time be vastly differently approached than it is now or it was 10 years ago. So across many countries, this is either ignored, uh, not talked about, um, but it affects your mother, your sisters, your your children too. It affects half the population. So we need to wake up to that. Thank you so much, Andy, for your time and for sharing this big vision for a fairly small organization with not so small impact. So really enjoyed talking to you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that. Andy, it's been a true privilege to gain insights from your vast experiences in healthcare and your expertise in building global connections. The strides you've made in nurturing relationships and advancing digital health are both inspirational and transformative. Today's enlightening episode of the Health Tech Crew podcast was presented to you by Kepler Team, renowned for our prowess in developing unmatched HIPAA-compliant software solutions Kepler Team stands as the beacon for healthcare visionaries. To our listeners, brace yourself for more deep dives into the dynamic confluence of health and technology in our upcoming episodes. Until then, stay informed and inspired.